The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Self-reliant citizens living in their own mortgage-free homes are the cornerstone of a free country. That is why, of all the manifold services rendered by the Equitable Society to nearly six million people, one which ranks near the top in importance is the Equitable's Assured Home Ownership Plan. In about 14 minutes, Mr. Keating will be back to tell you, homeowners, about the Equitable Society's famous Assured Home Ownership Plan. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Bank Theft. Its title, The Penny Lender. This coming Sunday, February the 18th, marks the beginning of Crime Prevention Week. Its purpose is to call attention to the alarming fact that in this country... Almost 5,000 major crimes are committed every day. That's more than 200 every hour, more than three every minute. The problem is made more difficult because as fast as the FBI and local law enforcement agencies succeed in putting seasoned criminals behind bars, new recruits step in to swell the criminal ranks. As fast as some go straight, others go wrong. In tonight's case, from official files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, you will see where these recruits come from. Some are previously law-abiding citizens who succumb to temptation. Others are borderline cases, hovering on the fringes of the underworld, who finally decide to cross the border into crime. Tonight's FBI file opens in a narrow alley just off Skid Row in a Midwestern city. Ragged men sit in clusters leaning against the brick walls, some sleeping, others trying to get one more drop from an empty bottle. In their midst is a neatly dressed elderly man with a small notebook in his hand. As he looks around, one of the derelicts rises and approaches. Uh, morning, Mr. Page. Well, how are you this fine day, Twink? Oh, broke. <laughs> Naturally. Nobody ever comes to see me when they're solvent. <laughs> uh, c- can I have some money? Now, let me examine my records. I paid you back last time. Alan Bentley Carson, and uh, here's your page, Twink. Now, you borrowed on September 6th, paid it off. October 9th, paid off. December 13th, paid. Uh-huh. Yeah, Twink, your account balances. So here's your loan. 60, 70, 75 cents. Oh, thanks, Mr. Page. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. All right, now, anyone else here who needs a small sum to tide them over, no security, just a friendly loan. <laughs> Use the money for a week. And... You, Leo Page. Well, that's right. My name's Fred Stewart. I was sent to see you. Well, now, you, you but... don't need references. I can tell an honest face when I see one. Uh, my limit for a loan is $2. Oh, Shylock, huh? Mr. Stewart, I'm a banker. You wish to borrow? No. And what is it you want? I hear you know every bum down here. Well, that's probably true. I know how you can make yourself three bills. $300? Mm-hmm. Mr. Stewart, there are limits to my scruples. This is legit. Uh, say, Mr. Page. Now, just a minute, Twink. Uh, go, go on, Mr. Stewart. My uncle Charlie hit the row, and I'd like to find him. Here's his picture. Well, now, a patrician face. You know him? Why, I've glimpsed his tragic features occasionally. Uh, uh, He's what the men call a loner. Where is he? He mentioned a sum of money. It's in my pocket. Well, I'll take a down payment of a third. You got it. Here. Consider me in your employ. The other deuce is yours when you come up with it. Now, there's a foul-smelling hamburger house near here called Slim's. Yeah, down the block. Yeah, there are tables there in the rear. 
You seat yourself at one, and I'll I'll join you there in an hour. Greetings, Mr. Stewart. I thought I'd grab a sandwich till you came. Oh, no, no, no. Put it back on the plate, sir. Man who runs this place thinks the pure food laws a myth. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Now, the business. You got some wood? I found them. Where? Mr. Stewart, I'm not reflecting on your character, but you're forgetting my fee. Tell me and I'll pay. Now, I, uh, I have a peculiar malady. Only one thing loosens my tongue. Money. Suppose you come up with a wrong joker. Mr. Stewart. I took a flyer giving you the yard before. This time you take the chance. That's your last word? Yeah. All right, sir. Farewell. Hold it. Here. One. One fifty. Two. All right, now talk. Yeah. Your dear uncle resides at the Star Hotel in room 19. I'll go see him right away. Later that day at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Walter Emery. Morning, Walt. Oh, hi, Jim. Here's a present. Another case? <laughs> Thanks. Frank Johnson was on it with me before he's transferred. What's it about? Well, a few months ago, bank examiners found the Broadway National books on the short side. Oh, how much? 37000 Uh-huh. The day the examiner showed up, the teller named Glenn Fillmore disappeared. Convenient. We kept a surveillance on his apartment friends, but we never got anything. The money turn up? No, we didn't have any serial numbers, but we sent Fillmore's picture to every bank. Mm -hmm. As far as we know, he never opened an account or rented a safe deposit box anywhere. Sure, Shale, a bookmaker. Oh, I don't think so this time. Fillmore was on the frugal side. Was? Yeah, the police just called. His body's been found in a room at the Star Hotel. The only star I know is on Skid Row. That's the one. He was living there under the name of Charlie Jones. Well, that money went fast. Well, maybe not, Walt. He was murdered, and there was no sign of any cash in the room. Oh, you want to examine the room with me? Oh, sorry, Jim. I've got an appointment. All right. If you get a chance, will you read up on the file? I'll check with you later. Good evening, Mr. Stewart. Your usual table? Yeah, please. This way, please. This one will do. Very good, sir. A wine list? Thanks. Did you see our friend? The job's done. Anything in his room? I threw what he had in the bag. Your girl in the check room. The uh, sauternes is excellent, sir, yes. When you go to the check room, there'll be an envelope in your overcoat. I had 300 expenses. For what? Finding him. Well, Vicky told you he was on Skid Row. It's a big street. I paid a guy to locate him. You got 2000 for the job. Plus expenses. Okay. Before I go for it, I want to see what I'm buying. I'll be right back. I'll be waiting. Here's your check, sir. Thank you. Vicky. Vicky, have you dipped into the bag yet? Just now. I found the receipt for a package. Here. Thanks. Village Warehouse, October 4th. That's the day he took it on the L.A.M. from the bank, so this receipt has to be for the package of dough. Yeah. Well, one way to find out, I'll claim it first thing in the morning. Walt? Hmm? Hey, Walt, anybody call me? Oh, no, Jim. Well, Fillmore's hotel room is cleaned out, but the porter told me somebody asked this morning how to find room 20. Was that Fillmore's? No, he had number 19. But it could have been the killer playing cute. 20's been empty for a week. Get any description? Yeah, but not a very good one. Porter's at police headquarters now going over pictures for us. I'm sorry I haven't cracked that file yet, but uh, I had an idea on it. No? You said Fillmore wasn't a type to gamble. Mm -hmm. How about women? No. No, he was a confirmed bachelor, too. The only evidence we uncovered about a girl showed he'd gone out a few times with somebody named Vicki Ogden. Who's she? Works in the hat check room at the Club Romeo. Great place for a bank teller's girl. Yeah, we thought so, too. So we worked on that angle for weeks, but it all added up to zero. Anybody check on her recently? Yeah, just two weeks ago. She still lives in the same hotel. She's kept a job. She does not spend her salary. Oh, I'll get one. Mm. Special Agent Taylor. 
Captain Carey at headquarters, Taylor. Yes, Captain. That porter make an ident yet? Six of them. He what? He's picked out pictures of six different men. Oh, who are they? I've got a messenger on his way over with the pictures, and I'm putting every man's record on the teletype. Well, thanks, Captain. I'll get under the wire room now and catch them as they come in. <laughs> Excellent shot, Mr. What? Stewart. I haven't seen a cue handled so deftly in years. <laughs> Aren't you out of your neighborhood, Mr. Page? Huh? Oh, possibly. Uh, I've been looking for you. Why? I wanted to tell you how badly I felt about your uncle, Charlie, being shot. Oh? Yeah. Having it happen right after I told you where he was living, it, that uh, was uh, really a coincidence. Oh. Uh, say, have you seen the late papers? Seems your Uncle Charlie was really somebody named Glenn Fillmore. Papers say Mr. Fillmore embezzled $37,000. Never shown up. This money wasn't in his room when he was found. Oh. My. Miss Q, didn't you? Look, why don't you get out of here? Oh, I haven't finished, Mr. Stewart. Now, I did a, a bit of uh, research on you this afternoon. I come up with some interesting figures. According to my informant, uh, you made a, a special leave of arranging for obituaries to appear. Like, uh, or to be blunter, you kill people. Now, wait a minute. Oh, uh, you, you, you don't kill them on an emotional basis. You do it for money. You only do it when someone pays you. Now, the specific reason for my visit is to find out who hired you to kill Fillmore. Look... All this talk bothers Mr. me. Mr. Stewart, if, now, if you leave, I might have to contact the police or pass on what I know to them. Huh? Yeah. Besides, you wouldn't want to leave that eight ball dangling in such a tempting fashion just above the corner pocket. Why, oh, you... Oh, now, now, hold on. Uh, in case you're thinking of applying your trade on me, I want you to know that I have planted letters in various places stating that if I shouldn't appear tomorrow morning... It'll be because of you. Now, oh. pick up your cue and chalk it. That's it. Now, Mr. Stewart, we'll become confidential. Having a fairly accurate knowledge of current markets, I'd say you got $2,000 for the killing. Is that right? About right. My dear boy, that's coolie labor. Well, from now on, I'm your friend, your advisor, and your partner. And whoever that client was is about to learn that 2000 wasn't your fee, but merely the first installment. Now, now concentrate, son, and pocket that eight ball. We will return in just a minute to tonight's exciting case from the official file, which shows how your FBI helps promote America's security. Now a special message for the heads of the families who are interested in mortgages on their homes. Do you know when a mortgage meets all the requirements of a truly modern plan? To qualify as truly modern, a plan must include two main elements. First, a painless method for paying off the mortgage years ahead of time. Second, Emergency protection for you and your family against foreclosure and disaster. Today, many thousands of American families have plans like that in the Equitable Society's famous assured home ownership plan. Of all homeowners, only a select group can qualify for this money-saving, home-saving plan. Here are the four special benefits they get. First benefit, this plan provides a painless way to pay off the mortgage years ahead of schedule. Here's the secret. This plan combines a low-cost first mortgage with life insurance protection. The insurance element creates a cash loan fund which increases steadily. Each year, the mortgage grows smaller and the cash loan fund bigger. After about 14 years, my equitable representative pointed out that my cash loan fund had grown big enough to clear off the whole 20-year mortgage. What a happy day that was. Second benefit. The cash loan fund is a friend in need when sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Last year, there was a slump in my business, and I was out for three months. My cash loan fund helped plenty in meeting our mortgage payments. Third benefit. If the owner dies, his widow doesn't inherit a mortgage. 
she inherits her home free and clear. What's more, the Equitable Society not only cancels the mortgage, but also returns to the widow every cent her husband had paid to reduce the principal. Lastly, the mortgage draws interest not at 6, not at 5, but at 4%, and closing costs are low. Naturally, a plan like this can't be offered to everyone. Your Equitable Society representative will tell you whether you can qualify for this money-saving, home-saving, assured home ownership plan. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Penny Lender. Undoubtedly, the criminals you have met in tonight's case from the FBI files strike you as thoroughly bad specimens of the human race. But remember, nobody is born all bad or all good. What brings evil to the forefront? For one thing, crime breeds on unhappiness. Unhappiness which may be rooted in poverty or caused by stupid parental handling in childhood. Parents who quarrel often and violently in front of their children Parents who openly and obviously favor one child over another make the unhappy homes from which juvenile delinquents, the criminals of tomorrow, are recruited. Correction of poverty is a long time process. Correction of unhappiness in youth is something we can tackle without any delay. Right now, there are any number of fine organizations in this field. The Scouts, the various boys and girls clubs sponsored by religious groups, and many other movements to help underprivileged children. These organizations go right down to the grassroots of crime prevention. They get the kids together for sports and wholesome group activities. They teach American ideals. They have helped transform thousands of potential delinquents into good citizens. If you are seriously interested in doing something about crime in Crime Prevention Week, remember these organizations. They need your help. They can use your time. They deserve your support. Tonight's file continues the following day in front of the building housing the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor meets Agent Walter Emery as he waits to cross the street. Hi, Walt. Hello, Jim. Say, I finished that other case, so I'm available. Yeah, that's great. Uh, where are you going now? Over to the garage for my car. Uh, come on, let's get across. Yeah. Any progress on those ident's the porter made? Yeah, we cleaned them up this morning. Three of the six men are in jail. Two others have jobs and were working at the time of the killing. Who's number six? Somebody named Fred Stewart. He was acquitted three years ago of attempted murder. Seems no witness could make positive identification. Sounds like the right man. Yeah, but the same thing might happen here. The porter's not sure it was him. Stewart got an alibi? Well, the police haven't located him yet, Walt. They promised to let us question him when they do, however. Where are you going in your car? Every storage warehouse in town. Why? Porter confessed that he was curious about a man like Fillmore being on Skid Row, so he let himself into his room one day. Yeah. May not be important, but he says he came across a receipt from some warehouse. Which one? Well, he didn't remember. You know, there's a good chance that Fillmore put that money in storage for a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, Walt, you get your car, too, huh? I'll give you Fillmore's picture. You see if anybody recognizes him. Okay, thanks. Uh, want me to take the north side warehouses? Okay. See you back at the office. Hello. Uh, Fred, my boy. This is Leo. Yeah, I know. I'm calling to tell you I did not dissolve our partnership last night just because you wouldn't give me the name of your patron. Uh, this morning, uh, I've been studying back copies of the newspapers. For what? Uh, knowledge. I found out, for example, that a young lady named Vicki Ogden was Glenn Fillmore's girl. That she worked at the Club Romeo. Why tell me? Well, uh, that's where you went after I left you last night. I followed you. <laughs> now, and now, Fred, save us both a lot of time. Tell me who it was. Uh, the... I haven't mentioned this, but your share of our partnership should be $10,000. Are you that loyal? Well, uh... $10,000, and I'll find out anyway. Roy Craig, the head waiter at the club, Romeo. Good boy, good boy. Now, uh, uh, what did you find in Fillmore's room? Oh, some old clothes, a pack of cigarettes, a toothbrush, receipt for a package. Uh, what kind of package? I don't know. Where was the receipt from? 
The village warehouse. Well, only one thing left to do now. Visit Mr. Craig. Uh, how many, sir? Hmm. I beg your pardon? How many in your party, sir? Oh, me? I'm alone. Would you like a table? Yeah, very much. Fine. This way, please. Uh, you're Mr. Craig. Yes, that's right. Find a table where we can talk. I'm sorry, sir. I'm not allowed to sit with the patrons. Well, uh, I know. Uh, perhaps this time you can break the rule. I'm sorry. Would the gentleman like this table? Fine. Uh, fine. Uh, Mr. Craig, uh, Fred Stewart sent me. I don't know anyone named Stewart. I came to talk about that package. Maybe I will sit down. Yeah. <laughs> Who are you? Uh, my name is Leo Page. By profession, I'm a, a fat collector. A what? A collector of nuggets of information. For example, I know about that girl in the check room. She was Glenn Fillmore's fiancée. Oh, what's that got to do with me? Well, now, among your souvenirs from Fillmore's room was a receipt for a package at the village warehouse. Uh, by, by posing as a policeman on the phone... <laughs> Uh, I've learned a man with a scar on his forehead picked up that package. You've got that scar. Listen, I don't uh, know You what... listen first. Fred and I both feel you cheated him. Ah, we want uh, an additional 20,000. 20,000? Would you rather tell the police how you came to use Fillmore's alias after his death? <laughs> well? Uh, meet me at 12.30 tonight. Excellent. Yeah, uh, where? At my house. The address is... 22 Ohio Avenue. How did you know? I told you. <laughs> I collect facts. That's one of them. Go on back to work. I'll see you at your home. Walt, we've got a lead. Somebody recognize Fillmore's picture? No, but the village warehouse records show that Fillmore left a package for storage on the day that he disappeared. In his own name? Under his alias, Charlie Jones. Oh. The records also show that the package was picked up this morning. Oh? Yeah, that's our lead. I know it's not a very good one, but it's something. You get a description of the person? Yeah, square-shouldered man with a long scar on his forehead. That's all? That's it. Must be a couple of thousand men in town who would answer that description. I'll get it, Walt. Yeah. Special Agent Taylor... Captain Carey Taylor. Yes, Captain. I've got some news on Vicki Ogden. Oh, what's that? She's moved and left no forwarding address. Oh, when that happened? Last week. She told the room clerk she was getting married. Uh, to whom? He didn't know. Uh, you checked at the club, Romeo? She still works there. Well, thanks, Captain. I'll go see her right now. Walt, I'm going over to Club Romeo to check on Vicki Ogden. If you get anything, meet me there. <laughs> Yeah, well. Have you interviewed the hat check girl? No, she left the club about an hour ago with a head waiter. His name's Roy Craig, and he's got a long scar running across his forehead. The man who came to the warehouse. That's it. The bartender identified Stewart's picture for me, too. He's been here a few times recently to see Craig. Uh -huh. Jim, Stewart has to be a Fillmore's killer. Oh, why? Just before I left the office, we got a teletype from Washington. Uh huh? According to the unidentified ammunition file, the bullets that killed Fillmore matched the ones in that murder case you were telling me about. It. The case where Stewart was acquitted? Right. Are uh, the police caught up with Stewart yet? No, not yet. Where did Craig and the girl go? No one knew. Any address on them? Not that the help here know about. Everybody's address is in the manager's office. And where's he? Out. And nobody knows when he'll be back. Well, Jim, we can't hang around here Wait all... Wait a minute, Walt. I've just remembered something. Let's find a phone. Get it, Vicky. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mr. Craig. Oh, come on in. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, this is a nice, intimate place you go. Oh, there's the charming Miss Ogden. How are you? Mr. Page, I told Vicky about your proposition. And what did you think, my dear? I hope you agree it's fair. What else can we do? Spoken like a true sport. <laughs> but we did figure 20,000 was a little steep. Oh, well, well now, uh, uh, that wasn't an arbitrary figure. I'm prepared to negotiate. Yeah, well, maybe we better have a witness to all this. Witness? Yeah. Come on in, Fred. Mr. Stewart. That's right. 
I was called in on the deal. Oh, I told you I'd handle these negotiations for you. We'd rather do business direct. Now, Stuart, Stuart, don't you let them tamper with our relationship. I promise to get you more money. We're giving you more money. Not for the old job, though, for a new one. Uh, am I to consider that a threat? That's a gun Fred has, Mr. Page. Yes, now, now, just, just a minute, Stuart. I told you before about those letters that I placed and planted everywhere. And the uh, harm befalls me, you know what'll happen to you. Yeah, Fred's told us all about that, too. But we figured out a way to get around it. Well, you, you, you... It's real simple. You can't hang a murder on somebody unless there's a body to be found. Nobody's ever gonna find yours. Yeah, now, now, just a minute. You're behaving very foolishly, Mr. Stewart. I promised you $10,000 from these people here. They can't be paying you that much. You, you, uh, killing me is extremely poor business. No, it ain't, Pop. He gets dough from us and cuts out the middleman. That's good business. Take care of him, Fred. Well, Hold it, Stewart. I'll get the gun, Jim. Right, Walt. Everybody just keep your hands in the air. Hey, what is this? Now, when we're through with this search, we'll all take a ride down to headquarters. Roy Craig, Vicki Ogden, and Fred Stewart were turned over to state authorities convicted in state court for murder and given life sentences. The money taken by the embezzling bank teller was recovered and returned to the bank officials. Unable to get Roy Craig's address at the nightclub office, Special Agent Taylor remembered the report about the marriage of Vicki Ogden. Checking the Hall of Records, he learned she married Roy Craig. From their license, he secured Craig's home address, a place to which they hurried with the results you have just witnessed. And now for further comment on tonight's case and on Crime Prevention Week, we bring you a message from the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Mr. J. Edgar Hoover. Mr. Hoover's words are, and I quote, Crime is today on the forward march. The latest statistics show higher and higher crime rates. Crime, however, is preventable if every citizen would do his share. Make crime prevention your business. Help your FBI and local law enforcement agencies. A vigilant public opinion intent on erasing crime in the community can erase it. The job lies in your hands. <laughs> Now one last question to homeowners. How would you like to be able to say... No more mortgage payments for me. I own my home free and clear. Why not put yourself in this enviable position while you're still young? Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. He'll be glad to show you how Equitable's assured homeownership plan makes it possible to pay off your mortgage years ahead of time. See your Equitable man soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, jewel theft. Its title, the canvas-backed frame-up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Michael Ann Barrett, Kenneth Barton, Whitfield Connor, Bill Conrad, Herb Ellis, and Joe Vitale. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The canvas back frame-up on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. There's fun for the whole family when Ozzie and Harriet come your way next. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.